Lord, we thank you that you are a God who answers prayer. We thank you that you are a God that keeps your word. We thank you, God, that you are a God that does all things well. Pray now, God, that you would bless my neighbor that I'm touching right now. God, that person I'm praying with on the East City campus, I pray you bless them right now, God. Would you meet every need they have? Would you show yourself strong and mighty in their life? Today, as your word goes forth, would you heal and deliver according to that word? Would you save for your name's sake? Would you speak to us in such a way, Lord, that when we leave here, we're better than how we came? Speak in such a way, God, that when we'll leave here, we'll be more alive, more vibrant, more clear. God, speak in such a way, God, that we can do exclusively what you've called us to do. I come against every attack of the enemy right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I claim victory in this room, victory on our East City campus. I claim victory in my neighbor's life right now in the name of the Lord. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is worthy. The Lord is worthy. You remain standing. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2 um, and verse 1. For those of you that are worshiping with us for the first time, allow me to add additional words of welcome. I'm almost always preaching in a sermon series. And so our Bible study series on Tuesdays is in the book of Proverbs this year. Um, and then to start the year off, I wanted to take a peek at the early church. And so Acts chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James Version. If you have it, say amen. amen. Type in amen if you have it. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the, this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we each hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Amen. As you take your seat, look at somebody and tell them, I want God to move in your life. Amen. You can have your seats today. I Put your hands on yourself and just shout out, God move. I want to tag this text and spend a moment or two with it on the subject, when God moves. And I could be by myself. I don't think I am. I hope I'm not. But it is my prayer that God would move in my life. As a matter of fact, it is my prayer, Gwen, that God would move in all of our lives. And as we begin unpacking what God's movement looks like, we do it from Acts chapter 2. This is a familiar passage of Scripture. It's a familiar passage of Scripture because here in Acts chapter 2, I want you to catch this in a moment, we see how the Holy Spirit begins a new and distinctive ministry on the earth. Something that had never been done before. He this is a time that they had been waiting for since the writing of the Old Testament. 
Because in the Old Testament, God would empower men. He would empower women. He would empower them for special service. But then after, catch this, in the Old Testament, after he empowered them for specific service, he withdrew his presence for a season once they accomplished what he had called them to do. Now here in the book of Acts, God once and for all is empowering his people permanently. Now, I, I want to go ahead and kill a, a theological, doctrinal, interpretive demon. Because I oftentimes will hear people in church talk about we need another Pentecost. That's like, that's like a woman giving birth to a child thinking I'm going to get pregnant with that child all over again. Once you give birth, that event is over. Now, I, I, I would argue that there's some unity we need. That there's some stuff that goes on during Pentecost that we need. But be clear about it. Ain't no tongues of fire sitting on your head today. Because the purpose of Pentecost was for God in Jesus to birth the church. Because prior to Acts chapter 1, chapter, chapter 2, there is no church. Here in Acts chapter 2, he now gives birth to the church. As he gives birth to the church, this begins to be this once in a lifetime phenomenon. So you and I live in a permanent Pentecost. We live in a perpetual Pentecost. We don't have to ask God to show up again. He's already shown up. And so in the text today, stay close. God is moving. And when God moves, he heals. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to your house. When God moves, he restores. When God moves, he gives you power to overcome temptation. Hello, somebody. When God moves, he gives you power to live right. When God moves, he brings a breakthrough in your life. Everybody say, I want God to move. Pentecost, stay close while I set this up, was the Jewish harvest festival that would, they would come before God with their offerings and their thanks for the harvest. The word Pentecost literally means 50th. So they started counting after the Passover, after the Passover where they celebrated during the exodus from Egypt and they would count off 49 days. And then on the 50th day, they would be in Pentecost. It was literally the Jewish equivalent of Thanksgiving. Y'all, I want to park here. God shows up when his people show that they are thankful. Can I just, can I sit this on your lap real quick? Some of us are asking God to move in our situation and God is saying, I'm waiting for you to show appreciation for how good I've already been in your life. And I think this might be a good time to take, even if it was 15 or 20 seconds to realize God has been mighty good and I don't ever want to be guilty of not showing a sense of gratitude and a sense of appreciation. I'm, I'm a preacher, y'all, but can we take a moment and just recognize, God, you've been good. You ain't been nothing but good. You've been faithful all the days of my life and I'm grateful for every door you've opened. I'm thankful for how you heal my body. I'm grateful that I didn't die in the emergency room. I'm, is there anybody other than me that is grateful and thankful for how good Come on, y'all don't act thankful over here. Are you grateful and thankful that God has been good to you? And God, I want you to show up, but when you show, God is saying, I'll show up, but you don't act like you appreciate me. Am I the only one with a head not been for God moving as he's moving and doing what he's doing? I would not be. I think there's a handful of y'all of you, you. I don't look nothing like my story. You would be amazed of what God has done. As a matter of fact, God has done what I did not deserve. And so God, before we go further, we want to just take a moment and say, God, I thank you for every miracle. I thank you for saving my soul. I thank you for peace in the midnight hour. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you. God shows up. Tell your neighbor, God shows up in a thankful room. 
And maybe that's why he ain't been at your house lately. Because you don't show enough appreciation. He shows up on a thankful job. He shows up. This is the season of thanksgiving for them. Can, can I real quick give you something to shout about? Can I tell you what's different in Pentecost than in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, God was a respecter of persons. Let me get them. In the Old Testament, he showed up with prophets. He gave special anointing for certain people. At the day of Pentecost, he was no respecter of persons. Every person that was assembled got the same anointing as everybody else. See, can I kill a demon? See, let me tell you all the blessing. You can join the church today. Get saved today. And at your moment of salvation, have every bit of much of the Holy Spirit as I do. That's why some folk can't handle church. Because they sit looking at you like, I've been here 10 years and I ain't had no chance to sing. They just joined, Pastor. They just got here. Well, they got just as much Holy Ghost as you do. So I don't know about you, but I'm thanking God that he didn't skip over me, Trishonda. I'm thanking God that he didn't go over me. He didn't pass me up. Is anybody in church grateful that God did not pass you by? What? Y'all, y'all, shh, y'all missed it. He wasn't just giving his spirit to folk with PhDs. He said, I got some GED folk. Y'all not here. He not just pouring his spirit out for folk that know how to quote the Bible without looking at it. He ain't just pouring his spirit out on folk that dress a certain way. He is no respecter of persons and regardless of what your back, oh, I'm sorry y'all. The guy that just got out of jail and is in church today can have just as much Holy Ghost as your church mother. And I'm grateful to God that he's no respecter of people. Matter of fact, tell two people, I got him too. I got him too. (laughs) Can I just go ahead and put this on your lap? Tell your neighbor, if you're a Christian, you Pentecostal. I, I ain't trying to... I ain't trying to call nobody out. I ain't trying to call nobody out. But Pentecostalism is much more than denominationalism. It's about the fact that the Holy Ghost is on me and the Holy Ghost is it. What kind of church y'all go to a Pentecostal one where everybody gets the spirit of God poured out on them? Y'all just how you see, how you see. Let me just, let me y'all y'all not even let me get to my first point. Let me let me see. The, the cloven tongue shows up in the room and individually, equally indiscriminately fills and anoints them. Come here, come get you. Filling and anointing are different. See, Ryan, I think this is the issue. Bunch of folk in the church anointed, but not filled. It... See, anointing is what God puts on you to complete the task he gave you. It's the power you need. It's the discernment you need. It's the favor you need. It's the wisdom you need. So he will anoint you to get the job done. The problem is I can't get the job done if I'm empty. Filling 
Tell your neighbor, feeling is conditional. See, okay, y'all. You, you, you ever, y'all, come on, y'all been there. I've been there. I'm, I, I'll call me out. As long as I'm going to be your pastor, I'm anointed to be up here. But every Sunday is not the same. Because depending on what my week or month was like, I have had times. See, everybody don't want to be honest. Where I came up anointed, but not quite as filled. Y'all, see, see, you can have an assignment and be empty. You can have a title. Y'all not talking. And be empty. You can have responsibility and be oh all nah. All right, let me let's get out of church. Y'all too holy. If you married, you are anointed to be the wife of your husband. But that don't make marriage easy. Because if you ain't praying for y'all, you might be anointed at home, but you also could be empty at home. And if God is going to move in people's life, I need to get something on the inside of me. All right, y'all. In the text, they're baptized with the Spirit. That means they belong to him. But they are not yet filled. Filling is... All of me belongs to you. Can I teach for a moment? Let me, let me make, because I, 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 the Lord told me y'all would be right where you are. And, 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 so, and so I jotted down four things real quick. This is not even in your notes. Lord gave it to me before I came out here. Let me tell you why sometimes we can be empty. Anointed, but empty. Because filling is ongoing. You, you can be full on Chinese food for an hour. <laughs> Look at your neighbor, tell him, but I need to eat again. I, it, it, see, it, everything you take in does not stay with you. Which means I have to work regularly on being filled. This is why sometimes you come to church and don't always get the same out of the service. It's not always a matter of I didn't preach right, they didn't play right, they didn't sing right. It's sometimes a matter of what's going on in me. So let me tell you what I'm learning. Let me just teach for a moment. I don't even know if I'm going to get to my first point. Let me, let me just teach for a moment. What helps me stay filled is obedience. I'm sorry, this is a discipleship grown up message. You can't be, oh God, I'm preaching better than I'm getting credit for. You can't be filled and disobedient. So when God calls you to do something that you're not being obedient to, it negatively impacts your feeling. Which means you're still anointed to preach, but ain't nothing really in you right now. You're still anointed to be the husband or wife you are, but you empty. So everybody say, be obedient. Uh-oh, it's, it's... The second thing that helps us stay full is having a devotional and prayer life. If I'm going to be filled, I got to spend time with him. I need to pray to him. I need to be in the word. This is why sometimes I can come to church. We walk out, man, that was so good today. And you thinking to yourself, no, it wasn't. It's not the people's lack of anointing. It is how filled we are. It, let me, look, Holy Ghost, help me. Let me, all right, let me say one more thing. See, I mean, you see it with athletes. You see it with people that do it. It doesn't have to be just church stuff. 
Ain't no doubt, nobody doubting you got skill. Nobody doubting you know to play. But if you got a hangover from last night, nobody doubting you got it going on. But if you didn't sleep good and your body tired, you know, so look, you, you got a minister on Sunday. Y'all know my, my thing. I don't do anything on Saturdays because I know I'm anointed to be in front of y'all. But if I bring y'all a tired body, I don't have no feeling. Can I just park here? The Holy Ghost telling me not to leave. Let me just park here for a moment. This is why I can't just give my family the worst of me. I know you anointed to be the husband or the wife you are, the dad or the, the, the son or the daughter you are, but when you get in front of the people you love, they deserve a good portion of you. They don't deserve you all tired and broken down and beaten down and I can't focus. The Lord says present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. So obedience will keep me filled. Having devotion, prayer life will keep me filled. This is gonna be a fancy church word. Um, we don't use a lot around here. Impartation. Pastor, what's impartation? Impartation is when you give to somebody else what the Lord gave to you. So on Sunday, it's a form of my preaching of impartation. Tuesday, when I teach Bible study, it is a form of impartation. And so what we see here in the book of Acts, God, so much I want to cover here, is that part of why God moves is based upon what he is doing, John, that he's never done before on the earth. Now, pay attention to this. There came a sound. I hope y'all can handle me rightly dividing this text because it's about to mess up everything you learned as a child. Acts 2 is all faith and no feeling. See, we have equated the movement of God to a feeling. This ain't about the, a feeling. Y'all don't believe me. I see, I knew I was going to have to take my time and teach you. Let me tell you what God was doing. Go, let's read it together real fast. The day of Pentecost had fully come. One accord in one place. Verse 2. There came a feeling. There came a sound. It filled the house. What filled the house? A sound. Not a feeling. It filled the whole house. Then they appears to them tongues. Fire sitting upon each of them, it appeared to them a tongue. What in the tongue appeared to be a tongue? Sat on each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to run. They began to dance. No, they began to. Let me teach the room, y'all, because he's ushering in a new dimension in which he moves. They began to speak with other tongues. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this feeling, when this sound occurred, they got confused because everyone felt Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who dance? Speak. 
speak Galileans? And how is it that we feel? God was teaching that in this dimension that he works, it is not about my feeling, it is about my faith. That he is teaching that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you don't have Pentecostalism without the word. Y'all, if you were to look at the Bible, look at this, y'all. At verse 14, it's Peter's sermon, Stephanie. And from verse 14 to verse 40, it's all preaching. Because God was saying in this season, I'm not going to move on how you feel, but I'm going to be moved based upon your faith. And if you have faith in the word of God, then I'm able to move in ways that you don't even believe in. <sighs> what? Can, I, can I educate y'all a little bit more? Y'all think it's colloquialism or black church preaching emotionalism when I'm preaching and I make this statement, y'all not hearing me. The reason I make the statement, y'all ain't hearing me, is because I recognize that unless you hear me, God can't move in your life. It ain't about how good you, it ain't about what you feel like. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm hearing him. I, because what difference does it make if we dance and we ain't heard nothing? What difference does it make if I leave here feeling good and the whole community is going to hell? What difference does it make if the pastor did preach and the organist did play, but at the end of the day, I feel good, but I'm still broke? We sure had church and it's still homeless folk. We sure had church and folk are still struggling. We sure had church. I, God said, I need y'all to hear something. Can I tell you what's killing the modern day church? A lack of sound biblical doctrine. It's, it's so funny to me. I'm, I'm going to get some hate emails. I don't care, though. <laughs> Let me tell you one of the biggest... <sighs> trying to be tactful. <laughs> I'm trying to educate the church. How many times have you heard? Don't, this ain't calling nobody out. Man, we had church today. And the Holy Spirit moved pastor didn't even get to preach well you help me understand Acts chapter 2 that when the Holy Ghost moved the pastor spent most of the service preaching so I'm going I ain't scared of y'all if whatever spirit is moving keeps the word from going forth then it ain't the Holy Spirit because at the end of the day when the Holy Spirit moves he moves in my life so I'm ready to hear so in the culture of the church that God moves in it is in faith not in feeling I'm sorry, that was a long introduction. I, you can be mad, but you can't deny the word. You say, man, did they, they Pentecost came, 3,000 folk, Holy Spirit showed up, they started speaking in tongues. 3,000 folk got saved. Well, day Pentecost showed up, Peter preached the longest sermon in the New Testament. And folk got saved because they could hear. See, don't hear me wrong. I want to feel good up in here too. 
but I want to hear the Lord. Most people must be misinterpret Pentecost being about speaking in tongues. Pentecost is having an ability to hear the word according to how I need to hear it. <laughs> so when does God move? I'm going to give them to you because I can't preach them. I'm out of town. When does God move? Well, first of all, God moves on his own schedule. You can't, I've seen this so many times as a pastor. I'm writing a sermon, I call it walking it off. And sometimes I'm in my office, I'm writing my sermon, that thing hit my spirit so good, I just gotta get up from my desk and just kinda walk it off. I'm like, whoo, whoo, this is gonna be so good when I preach this on Sunday. And then I preach it and y'all looking at me like I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> and then there's a point that for me is a sub point that don't really mean a whole lot. And I gotta shut the sermon down. Because none of us get to dictate to God what his schedule is. And we have to recognize as believers, you can't schedule in a move of God. You can't script in a move of God. That God moves according to his own schedule. And if I don't, you don't hear me say anything else. Pentecost was a scheduled and calendared activity by God. He moved in a way that they weren't expecting. I hope this will minister to somebody. Don't be upset about anything that's going on in your life. It may not be on your calendar, preach Pastor James Gale, but it was on God's calendar. I know that funeral you went to was not on your calendar, but it was on God's schedule. And at some point, we've got to trust God that if you have allowed me to experience what I'm experiencing, it must be because you've got something better in store for me. It must be that you are moving in such a way. It may take you by surprise, but it won't take God by surprise. Yo, I, I don't even have time to go over all the feasts, but if we were to go through all of the feasts of the Old Testament, you will start to see evidence upon evidence that God not just randomly doing stuff. That when you start to see, you see examples of it in the Old Testament where they started with the Passover and then after the Passover, they started preparing, um, after the Feast of the Passover, they prepared the Feast of Unleavened Bread and then the Feast of Fruits and then following the Passover, they began representing uh, the resurrection of Jesus in Leviticus 23 and then there was the seven weeks later, that was the seventh Sabbath and then the Feast of Pentecost and then the Feast of Weeks. See, this did not just happen. Hear me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to cause somebody to feel better about you. You got told a lie. Or you believed one. You got to thinking about, you know what? My mama didn't plan to have me. I must have been an accident. How come I'm 21 years younger than my brother? I must be accident. Let me help you. You're not an accident. It, your mama may not have planned for it. Your daddy may not have planned for it. But the Lord was preparing for you from the foundation of the world. Where you were born is not an accident. Who you were born to is not an accident. Where you went to school is not an accident. When you went to jail was not an accident. The relationships that didn't work out was not an accident. The things that happened in your life, the things that God was fixing and moving and releasing and arranging and adjusting and mending and repairing. Tell your neighbor, none of it was an accident. God moves on his schedule he moves on his schedule I think somebody just got delivered somebody just got set free 
So you better stop being jealous about where people are on their schedule that may be different than where you are on your schedule because God is saying, I ultimately run the calendar of life and I know at the right time, in the right season, at the right moment, I'm going to break through and open a door. Is there anybody in church that can testify of your life? I was scratching my head wondering when my moment was going to come. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, unexpectedly, God opened up a door and God made a way because God moves according to his schedule. Can I just... Can I just prophetically say this to somebody that the Lord told me to say it to? And I don't know who it was for, who it's going to be for. But God just told me to say this. Earlier would have killed you. Matter of fact, tell your neighbor earlier would have killed you. You couldn't have handled the job earlier. You couldn't have handled the relationship earlier. You couldn't have handled the promotion earlier. You couldn't have handled the door opening up earlier. God knows exactly when to move on his schedule. You, there are people, you've been hanging around this church, flirting with us, and God is like, all right, today's the day on the schedule. Real quick, I got three minutes. God moves, tell your neighbor, according to his own schedule. Now here's the second thing. God moves when I am sensitive to his spirit. I want you to jot down this, put this in your, in your margin, expectation. When the day of Pentecost, everybody say, had fully come. When it had fully come, they were on one accord. They had assembled in a place where everybody with them was sensitive and waiting for God to do something. I'm not going to preach this point long. I just need you to get this in your spirit. Stop hanging out with folk with low expectations. It... it if, if, if you don't believe for more, take that lack of faith and low expectation to a different house. But in me and my house, we expect God will heal. In me and my house, we expect God to deliver. In me and my house, we expect God to save. In me and my house, I'm going to be sensitive. However you want to bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Is there anybody in the room that is sensitive and is believing any day now the Lord will show up? I'm gathering some folk together, listening gathering the folk together and I need you to understand this y'all the wind blew and they heard it but I need you to get this folk outside the room didn't hear nothing can I just minister this point for a high second be, around, be careful being around folk that God is speaking and they act like they can't hear him. I need to get around some folk, y'all, that are sensitive to him. I'm done. When God moves, it's when I'm sensitive. But here's the last thing. God moves when I'm serious. Tell your neighbor, I'm serious. Right. Tell me, I don't know about you, but I'm serious. Chapter 2, verse 1. They were all with one accord in one place. They were serious about being in an environment where God was going to show up. The seriousness of their life is shown in their commitments. There's some folk, I'm so glad y'all sang that, don't mind waiting. Because there's some of us in the space, you've made a commitment, but you've grown weary in the delay. I'm 
Tell your neighbor, but I'm going to wait this one out. Good Lord, I heard the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say, tell somebody else, I'm going to wait this one out. I, when you know God has made you a promise and you know he's spoken into your life and it's been a little bit of a delay, I'm here to tell you better not walk away until God does what he has promised he was going to do. You better wait on him. Is there anybody in church that is glad I did not grow weary in my well-doing, but I waited on him? Oh, I'm out of time. Be clear about your commitments. The commitment you've made to your family. The commitment you've made to your career. The commitment that I've made. Let me tell you what I'm learning. I'm done. I really am. I'm closing my Bible. Can, I, can, I, can y'all handle my growth? Here's my growth. I quit 100% of the commitments God never told me to make. Which means if he has told you to commit to something, wait on him. Be serious about this thing. Wait on him until he shows himself strong in your situation. All I'm trying to say to us today is that there is a moment when God moves. He moves on his schedule. Be patient. Be patient. I got a minister to somebody. Your recently scheduled surgery was on God's calendar before you were born. The phone call you got to rush to the emergency room was always on God's schedule. The pink slip you got that you're now out of work, it was on God's schedule. God moves on his schedule. Which means, can, you, can I give you a reason why you need to be saved other than heaven? Let me give you the reason. Because you need to know the person that's making up your schedule. Since he making up my schedule, I need to know him. He moves when we are sensitive and he moves when we are serious.